Happy Thursday, Dog Nation. Welcome into Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans. I'm really excited about today's show. A lot of y'all know I, I like the history of college football. I like the history of Georgia in particular. On today's show, we're going to have some fun looking back on one of the most historic moments in certainly modern Georgia history, the hobnail boot catch, the touchdown pass. Veron Haynes hauls in for the dogs in Neyland Stadium back in 2001. We're going to have Veron Haynes on the program today. Also, plenty of pursuit of Georgia and its attempt to be better with its pass rush. We'll talk to a guy that knows the pass rush game as well as anyone. He also happens to be a former Vol, so he can give us some insight on Tennessee. We'll have Chuck Smith on today's show, too, so busy when it comes to guests. We'll talk Jake Fromm off the top and a little bit of look at the 2020 uh, recruiting class when it comes to the running back position. Pretty interesting twists and turns. Admittedly, from my perspective, I don't think this is necessarily great news, but at least it is news, and so we'll try to touch on what's out there right now and what Jeff Sintel has told us here recently. So we'll cover all of these bases. We're really glad you're with us. Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans, begins right now. Presented by DogNation.com, this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans. Here's your host, Brandon Adams. All right, so uh, we got a fun show coming up on today's uh, program. We're going to get Chuck Smith a little bit later on. We'll talk to him about the situation for Georgia as it tries to improve its pass rush here. Kirby Smart's obviously talked a lot about that. We'll get Chuck on that coming up in a little bit. And before we're done here today as well, we're going to check in and check up with uh, the great former Georgia Bulldog who had one of the signature moments in modern Georgia history. Remember the hobnail boot play, the victory for Georgia against Tennessee back in 2001? We're going to talk to uh, Veron Haynes, the guy who hauls in that touchdown, uh, allows Georgia to get the win there at the buzzer against the Vols, one of the great moments. We'll look forward to doing that with him coming up in just a little bit. Before that, though, I want to start our show and our conversation today by talking about Jake Fromm and some of the stuff that's been out there on Fromm as of late. We predicted this on really Friday. It ended up being true over the weekend that with Georgia not playing, a lot of the other teams kind of playing, I'm talking about major national contenders, uh, kind of playing you know, easy to beat up on opponents. There would be a little bit of a comparison game that went on with what we've seen with Georgia through four games, what we've seen from some of these other teams getting a chance to play while Georgia was off on week five. And Boy, they're prolific offenses out there right now, right? I mean, Alabama's got one. Uh, Oklahoma's got one with Jalen Hurts at the moment. Justin Fields, give him credit. He's doing big things right now for the Ohio State Buckeyes. And there's a little bit of a comparison, especially given the fact that at least a couple of these guys, Eason at Washington, Fields at Ohio State, the fact they played at Georgia, there's always going to be a tendency you want to compare. Okay, so what's happening for Georgia here? Uh, with its own offense led by Jake Fromm. And admittedly, if you want to go back and look, especially at the first half of the Notre Dame game, maybe we didn't all love exactly what we saw from the Dogs' offense there. Now, Georgia gets a top-10 win. The only team in the country, as one of our commenters pointed out this week, to beat a team currently ranked in the top-10 is Georgia. But when it comes to style points and you know sexy offense and things like that, how well is Georgia keeping pace? How well is Jake Fromm in particular keeping pace? With that in mind, I thought our buddy DJ Shockley doing some great work now for the SEC Network. I thought he had a pretty good piece of advice, you know, not only for fans in terms of how to interpret what's going on with Georgia offensively, but what Fromm needs to do with the ball in his hand to kind of keep pace with these top offenses and for Fromm in particular to keep pace with these top quarterbacks. Uh, Shockley says, yeah, listen, I'd love like anybody else to see the uh, reins loosened on from just a little bit, but within the confines of what currently is the Georgia offense, there's still, still plenty of opportunities and still plenty of moments for from. I thought from DJ Shockley on the SEC Network, this was pretty interesting. Take a listen to this. I would love to see him throw it around. We would love to see Fromm put up those numbers, and I think he could, and it would show what they have on the outside. But here's the bigger thing for me is, when you run the ball as much as Georgia does, when you get those limited opportunities as a quarterback, you have to hit them. Continue to be consistent in, in the pass game. Continue to make good decisions, like we talked about pre-snap at the line of scrimmage. Get your team in and out of good play, in and out of bad plays, and get into good plays. Then Georgia will continue to be the dominant team they are. You can't have a letdown this week because everything is going your way. Listen, I for the most part completely agree with what Shockley says there. That first of all. I would love to see Fromm just get a little bit more freedom to do what I believe I know he can do because we've seen him make big throws before. I wish this offense catered sometimes more towards him when it comes to that kind of stuff. 
I don't need that to always be the case. I certainly don't want to see George abandon the run, but I think that Fromm is a good enough quarterback among the best in the country. It'd be nice to see him have a little more freedom sometimes to kind of show off his skill set on that. However, the other point that Shockley makes, which I think is a good one, is that even within the confines of the current offense, one that runs the ball more than it throws it, there's still plenty of big-time opportunities for Fromm to maximize his chances when he gets to throw it. Because the one thing that Fromm has always possessed that puts him among the national elite, you know, his athleticism in terms of running around in the pocket may not match what some other quarterbacks do, and his arm strength may not match what some other quarterbacks around the country do, and his overall total passing yards might not always match what other quarterbacks in the country do. But the one thing that Fromm possesses, which I believe is truly an elite skill, it's the reason why I believe NFL scouts are watching him closely. It's the reason why I think that Fromm has a very good chance of being a first-round pick, even if he wants to leave after the 2019 season. It's his accuracy. He delivers the football into tight windows, into tight spots. He's just very good at putting the ball on the number. And that's the reason why, even with a limited number of throws, Georgia throwing it less than it runs, Fromm still has a chance to have a really big year because uh, no one can put it into a tight window as well as Fromm probably can. And I think you can look at the overall numbers for Fromm and see evidence of that. His overall passing yards will never be as high as some, but his efficiency numbers are always quite high. Yards per attempt, for instance. Uh, It's one of the reasons why that Georgia can have a dynamic passing offense without passing the ball all that much more than it already is. So when we've asked for more freedom for Fromm, We're not talking about drastically changing the nature of the UGA offense. We're just talking about a little more opportunity to do the things that we believe Fromm can do. And I referenced the first half of the Notre Dame game, for instance, on this. I think what was frustrating about that is is not that Georgia wasn't throwing the ball. They were actually throwing the ball a decent amount. But they were choosing to throw so many safe, short throws that, uh, you know, what Fromm does best, the efficiency part of this, uh, you know, that didn't, that didn't come to bear there in that game. When you're throwing it a bunch for a limited number of yards, that's not very efficient. The second half is a much better example of that. And as Georgia moves through the month of October, where it's going to face, you know, overmatched opponents like Tennessee this Saturday, South Carolina, Kentucky after that, seeing Fromm get a little bit more freedom within the, you know, the, the boundaries of the current Georgia offense to kind of show off his skill set. I think for a lot of Georgia fans, that's a pretty interesting thing to pay attention to. Now, on the subject of the Georgia offense for a moment, and Fromm in particular, uh, DJ Shockley's partner in the SEC network, Jordan Rogers, I also had thought I had a pretty interesting point, at least from his perspective, about what he's seeing from the offense right now. In terms of this offense being as high flying and keeping pace with the other, you know, truly elite offenses in college football right now, from Rogers' perspective, it's not all on from shoulders. There's actually something else that Rogers says he still wants to see. You may not necessarily agree with this, but at least I thought it was pretty interesting and worth playing here on our program. Here's the former Vandy quarterback, Jordan Rogers from the SEC Network. I know they got playmakers on the outside, no doubt, big athletic receivers. I still haven't seen a guy like a Miko Hardman that can separate in the slot when Jake Fromm needed it so bad. I Blaylock is trying to be that guy Blaylock for can, Demetrius trying, Robinson, yeah. Tyler Simmons. They got yeah. guys. I just haven't seen a guy that's like right. going to be a dude. Yeah. When the fourth quarter, Take when they it, need it down, the, yeah, I want to yeah. see that position emerge. First of all, it's Robertson, not Robinson. Y'all know that. Maybe uh, Rogers, not quite aware of that as of yet, but the overall point that he brings up, I don't necessarily think is a bad one. We look at the potential of Robertson kind of still getting acclimated to the Georgia offense, certainly the potential of Pickens and, and Blaylock as true freshmen, Cager transferring over from Miami, big game against Notre Dame, and we look at those four guys probably primarily now as the top quartet among the Georgia receivers, and there is probably still, at least among the people who are watching this stuff closely, whether it be around the country, around the SEC, around wherever, to see, well, which of these wide receivers is truly going to emerge? Which of these, which of these guys is going to truly become a dependable target for uh, Jake Fromm? And I think it's interesting that uh, DJ pushes it for to potentially be Blaylock. Obviously, around here, we've also tied it for Pickens and Robertson and uh, really cage with this entire group here. But it is probably fair to say that this passing offense for Georgia, the offense in total for Georgia, maybe like the entirety of the team, is still a bit of a work in progress. Saturday against Tennessee gives us a chance to learn more about that. Uh, the rest of the games in the month of October give us that a little bit there as well before the ones that matter the most starting the month of November, Florida, Auburn, everything else in between. But while we're on the subject of quarterbacks, let me talk about the Tennessee side of this for a moment because one of the interesting storylines here this week has been Vols coach Jeremy Pruitt's, I shouldn't even say hesitation, his downright reluctance or or unwillingness to name a starting quarterback on Saturday after the struggles of uh, previous starter Jerry Garantano. In fact, here is what Pruitt told the media this week in terms of 
why he does not plan on name a starting quarterback. We're not going to give Georgia a scout report of what we're going to do this week, so we're going to rep the guys that we feel like gives us the best opportunity to have success. So he says he's not going to do that. No scouting report for Georgia coming uh, their way in terms of the starting quarterback. You know, there's a guy like Cole Stout, for instance. They've uh, given equal reps to the guys there in practice here this week. But once again, to go back to our buddies in the SEC Network, fair to point out that while Jeremy Pruitt tries to participate in some gamesmanship, neither Shockley nor Rogers think that Tennessee will ultimately go away from George, uh, Jerry Garantano. In fact, here is Shockley on that point. Garrett Town is a guy. I yes, think he's a he guy. Is. He just has to be more consistent in his ball. Can't turn it over no. for one. Uh, that's a big part of any quarterback's game. But Garrett Tano has to be more consistent in the pocket. And I wonder if they're asking him to do too much at the line of scrimmage. You said they get down to two, one seconds on the clock a lot of times. He has to be more consistent and then also take a little bit off his plate. Just yeah. allow him to play. So I think that's pretty interesting from Shockley on that in terms of maybe what uh, what Garantano hasn't done to this point or maybe how Tennessee's used him up to this point. By the way, for what it's worth, Jordan Rogers also agrees that Garantano's ultimately going to be the guy for Tennessee on Saturday, and maybe it's also a case of another SEC Network analyst pointing the finger at Jim Cheney and Jeremy Pruitt for how Garantano's been used. Here is uh, Jordan Rogers again. Garantano is the best quarterback they have on roster. I think last week pulling him, putting him back in, that's a challenge. Like, look, we're not going to yeah. put up with this. It, just because you're the most talented doesn't mean you're going to run out there every snap. You have to be better. So Pruitt has laid down a challenge for Garantano. He needs to answer the bell. So, so ultimately, we have a situation on Saturday where quarterbacks are kind of a big storyline for different reasons. The Tennessee quarterback has really struggled. The Georgia offense kind of continuing to round into form. One way or another, if you're tuning in to watch this thing on Saturday night, they'll expect both signal callers for very different, very different reasons to generate a lot of conversation on the television broadcast. My name is Brandon Adams, and this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans. Hello to you, and thanks for being with us. No matter how you get to us today, live on video, 10 a.m., Dog Nation Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, radio at noon on Athens Sports Radio 960, The Ref, and as a podcast, Apple Podcast Player, the Google Podcast Player, wherever you find them, including the world-famous dognation.com. Just really glad to have you with us today. As I told you off the top of our program, we have two very special guests coming up today. We'll talk to the former Georgia running back, Veron Haynes, a little bit later on. We'll reminisce about his great moment in 2001 when Georgia went on the road against a top-10 ranked Tennessee team and pulled a huge upset in Mark Rick's first year as UGA coach. Uh, That will be fun with him, and we'll also get some more intel on the Vols and a little bit of insight into Georgia's pass rush with our buddy Chuck Smith here coming up in just a couple of minutes, too. So busy with us when it comes to guests. Before that, though, let's go around the doghouse here today, brought to you by Online Trading Academy. And I want to push pause on the Georgia-Tennessee talk for a moment and talk a little bit about UGA recruiting because some pretty interesting stuff from Jeff Sintel yesterday as a part of Before the Hedges presented by Kroger. Obviously, Georgia is working its way towards another elite class here for the class of 2020. But one of the, I guess, unknown situations, one of the places where there's still a little bit of drama for Georgia involves the uh, running back situation. Now, Georgia already knows it's got one great back in the fold, and he's certainly a fan favorite. I'm talking about the five-star Kendall Milton. But we're also the belief that Georgia probably wants two for this class. At one point in time, it seemed like Georgia might be able to pair Milton with another five-star, Zachary Evans. But as Jeff Sintel said yesterday, kind of punctuating what Most of us have thought for a while, certainly at the moment, Evans seems to be trending in a different direction. Here is Jeff from yesterday on Zachary Evans. Let's try to do that with Evans again. Let's let's, let's see if we can hear Evans. Um, We'll see if we can hear him again here. Georgia and Zachary Evans at one time was a very clear reality It's very muddy now to the point where listen folks the running back position is going to be what it is going to be for Georgia they're exploring all options right now in terms of who's going to be the best running back fit for the class of 2020. So Jeff all of a sudden thinks that George and Zachary Evans may not be in uh, that great of a, a relationship anymore so where does that leave Georgia going from here? If it's not Evans, uh, what about some potential other names? Well, Jeff also talked a little bit about those, but admittedly even these start to feel like maybe a little bit of tough putts because they are both committed elsewhere. Let me start with the Miami commit, Don Chaney. We've heard Jeff talk about him a couple of times. Can Georgia really pull Chaney based on the fact that when he's been interviewed by Dog Nation recently, going back to the summer, he had some very nice things to say about Miami. Here is Jeff on Chaney. 
Well, there's a time when he was ready to commit and felt like he was going to was going to commit to Georgia. That time passed. Uh, he is a Miami Hurricane through and through. Still repping the 305. Just got to see what happens there with that Miami program. To me, looking at all those running backs, if you go, if you go Cheney, you go Johnson, Clayton, you go Lloyd, you go Bigsby, you go Evans, or other, or none of the above. I think the most likely scenario for me, the most likely scenario for me right now, might be either uh, undecided or none of the above. Mm-hmm. But if I had to pick a, a guy that I feel, as of today, would be the ideal choice for Georgia at the running back spot to pair with Kendall Milton, I think that would be Don Chaney Jr. So real talk there from Jeff, that Georgia may not get any of these elite backs to pair with Milton that we've talked about, but Chaney might be the best bet of all. How about Tank Bigsby, though, the fan favorite from Hogansville, Georgia, a guy that a lot of Georgia fans really wanted, and some wanted even over Zachary Evans, but Georgia kind of let that one go for a while. Bigsby ends up committing to Auburn. Has the ship sailed with Tank Bigsby? Well, once again, here's some sort of blunt assessment of that scenario when it comes to Jeff Sintow. There's a history there with Georgia and Tank Bigsby. There's some good history. There's some not-so-good history that I think all that stuff needs to be navigated no, let, let's face it, guys. There was a time when Tank Bigsby looked like he wasn't going to go to Georgia, and then he was going to go to Georgia. But then Zachary Evans and the, the mutual affection on both parties kind of kind of made that a little choppy water right now. And I think everybody's past that. But, man, I don't know if the damage can be undone because you got to give Auburn credit. They're winning. They're surging as a program right now. And it looks like Tank Bigsby sees a quarterback that's going to keep a lot of guys – out of the box, or at least some guys out of the box, for the foreseeable future on the plane. So interesting stuff there from Jeff Sintel. Not exactly optimistic about Georgia's chances with the Tank Bigsby at the moment. Maybe still a little bit of a chance with Don Chaney, but for the most part, the pursuit of Zachary Evans would have seemed to have cost Georgia in terms of the time it was able to spend with some of these other running backs, and that becomes a little bit of a tricky situation for Georgia here as a part of the class of 2020. We'll keep watching that. It's Around the Doghouse. It's presented by Online Trading Academy. We all want more money, and one of the best ways to get money, probably the best way to get money, is to uh, make the markets work for you. But you got to learn how to uh, how the markets work, and that means the decision to invest in yourself. And Online Trading Academy provides you a chance to do that both in the classroom and online. You can learn a variety of trading styles across a spectrum of trading classes you know that you can make the markets work for you no matter which direction they're moving you can learn how to make money in the markets trading uh, online trading academy gives you a chance to do that the website you want to go to is tradingacademy.com slash atlanta it's tradingacademy.com slash atlanta you can get in touch with my friends at online trading academy all right it's great to have you here today as part of dog nation daily we've got the former georgia running back veron haynes coming up a little bit later on for now though for a chance to talk some uh, pass rush some game against the vols on saturday let's talk to our buddy chuck smith here on dog nation daily as well and we will get chuck here coming up in just a moment the as soon as he's uh, ready to go uh sounds like he might be ready to go here so we'll uh, get ready to rock and roll with him and i'll say one more time it's a uh, great to have you here on dog nation daily All right, so uh, Chuck Smith, the uh, great former Falcon, uh, my partner on AJC, Falcons News Now, sponsored by Miller Lite. We do that every Monday and Friday at 1 p.m. on the AJC Falcons News Now Facebook page. He's also a former Tennessee Vol, and seems like a good enough week to have him back on the program here on Dog Nation Daily because we always love a chance to talk to Chuck. So, uh, Chuck, I really appreciate you being with us. I hope you're doing well, and uh, thanks for being a part of our program here today. Well, it's good to be here. Thank you for the uh, invitation. Well, I'm happy to have you with us, and I guess let me start with this, if you don't mind. Um, the situation there at your alma mater, now, admittedly, for a lot of the folks in our audience, they're having a good time watching Tennessee go through the struggles they're going through, but as an, <laughs> alum- <laughs> as an alumnus here, as someone who you know uh, certainly wants the best for Tennessee, including this Saturday against Georgia, what is your current take on kind of where things are and you know Pruitt's ability to manage all this, Philip Fulmer, the athletic director's ability to manage Jeremy Pruitt? What have you thought of what you've seen from Tennessee thus far? Well, it's disappointing optimism. That's the only thing you can have. I mean, you're disappointed where our program is, but you got optimism because you got to believe in that team. You know, and the team's bigger than any coach, but we got to find a coach that ultimately, and hopefully it's Coach Pruitt. But, you know, it's disappointing, but you're optimistic when you got fans, you got great fan base. You know, you just, uh, you're just praying that the pieces will be put in place 
and you'll be able to come out of this funk that's been going on for quite some time. Yeah, I mean, one of the things we've talked about this week is from a Georgia side of things, and certainly, Chuck, you remember this, and you know a lot more finally than we do. You know, when I'm growing up, you know, Tennessee is winning this game every year. Georgia loses nine straight at one point to Tennessee. You were part of some of those Tennessee wins here over Georgia. And to watch the miraculous transformation, you know, even after a a few years back and forth where it seemed like, you know, both sides were kind of fighting for the advantage, to watch the miraculous transformation now where, you know, Georgia's winning the recruiting battles, Georgia's winning the games on the field. From your perspective, what has it been like and what do you think led to, I guess, in some ways, the, the erosion of the Tennessee program? Well, I think some of it had to do with um, not as much the transition from the coaches. I just think it also had to do with change, you know, became, you know, started being, you know, social media, all these different things. And I'd say in the mid-2000s, all kinds of different ways coaches were recruiting. And I think people from the University of Tennessee, the state of Tennessee's high school um, recruiting base is not very good. So the foundation, if the foundation of your program has to recruit nationally to get top players, um, there's only a few in Tennessee. So to me, that, that's really the big, what I believe, and not a lot of people, uh, I've never heard anyone else say that, but I, I'm a witness to watching it because the guys they get from the state, they're not like Alabama, they're not like Georgia. So I think Georgia, when they, well, they've always gotten good recruits, even under Mark Rick. I just think it's, uh, they've turned it around. What do you expect to happen on Saturday? Obviously, Georgia's a big favorite in this game. Last year, we saw Tennessee show a little bit of fight against the Dogs there in Athens, and I think that for the game, Jeremy Pruitt was actually pretty disappointed because he thought his team had played pretty hard there, and you know, obviously, you know, Georgia ends up earning the victory. What are your expectations for what to see on Saturday? A Georgia team kind of coming in, looking to position itself for the month of November where it's going to play a lot of tough opponents. Tennessee obviously just needs to gain a little momentum for itself. What are your expectations for this Saturday? Well, I expect the fans to be rowdy. I expect, you know, the players to come out and compete and, you know, try to win the game. So, you know, B.A., I'm calling it. I'm looking at it, maybe, say, Tennessee 33, Georgia 6. <laughs> <laughs> come on now, Chuck. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, we, we got to have some fun with it. We are down. Because my friends from Athens, they're like, they blow me up, man, about the dogs because for years. I was absolutely a hazer of the Georgia-Tennessee game. So now, you know, I'm just messing around. But I think, you know, Tennessee come out and play hard. You got to remember also, Tennessee right now, they're a very, very, very young program, starting a lot of freshmen. But, you know, they got to come out and compete, man, throw their best shot. You know, I'll just say this. I'm not saying it'll be up that not Tennessee will win. But I will say this. I've seen bigger upsets in sports. So let's not act like, you know, anything can happen. Fair but nice. right now, Tennessee is not looking that good for the balls. But I'm behind them 100%. Go Big Orange. All you, all you dog fans, listen, balls for life. Our time will come again. And that score one day, I'll be on the winning side. But I don't know about this weekend, bro. Fair, <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough, Chuck. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> While we have you on here, one of the things I always like yeah. talking about with you is uh, certainly the pass rush for Georgia. It's been such a hot topic this year. And, you know, a couple times this year, Georgia's kind of really gotten it going, uh, admittedly against some of the lesser opponents that it's played. But it has been very active in the backfield against Murray State, against um, against Arkansas State. That was the case. Maybe not quite as much as they would have hoped against Vanderbilt and against Notre Dame. Certainly they seem to have a pass rush game plan. But Ian Book, to his credit, was just getting rid of the football, and they seem to kind of scheme around what George was trying to do. I really like George's third down, uh, you know, formation right now, where you got Nolan in the game a lot, you got Jermaine Johnson in the game a lot, you even got a defensive lineman like Trayvon Walker in there, who's you know got some athleticism. He's played a little bit for Georgia on some of these third downs, so they're clearly trying to make the pass rush an emphasis. And the results up to this point in time maybe a little bit mixed. I mean, what would you say about maybe what you've seen from Georgia thus far, Nolan included, because I know you have kind of a special relationship with him and kind of where you think it kind of needs to go from here? Um, I think, you know, they got some young guys, man, that are, you know, rushing. But, I, like, I've I said this for a long time. It's got to be a culture. Georgia doesn't have a culture of pass rush. You know, guys like Nolan Smith, I li- you know, you like to see him step up. But you got to remember, Davin Bellamy, Lorenzo Carter, five stars, man, they couldn't rush. No disrespect, they didn't get the numbers. So, in college, they're, you know, they're better rushers now than they are in the pros, so not a shot at Georgia, but they haven't been a culture. You know what I'm saying? And, mm-hmm. um, and, and But I will say this, for Georgia to take that next step, the, the, the key to this, man, 
is Nolan Smith, man. He's the fran- hey, he's the franchise piece now, and it's gonna be him. You know, to me, I know everybody can talk about the other guys, but Nolan Smith is special. He's special. The other guys, they they got potential to be great. Nolan Smith has potential to be a top five NFL pick. None of them other guys have that potential. I love Georgia's potential. I love what they're you know, I love what Trey Scott's doing now. They are creating a culture now. They don't quite have it yet, but Trey and Kirby and all those guys are. You know, they're putting a lot of emphasis on it, and I love that. I love that Kirby comes out and says, we need to get better. And I like what they've done so far this year. They're going to get a lot of sacks this year. They're going to have a great year. They'll, they'll be better in a couple weeks than they are now, obviously, but it'll start against Tennessee. Tennessee, they, they give up sacks, man, like like it ain't nothing. <laughs> Jagarantano <laughs> is a sack machine. So this is a good game to get started again. <laughs> Well, Chuck, certainly Georgia, certainly Georgia fans like the idea of that. But on a more serious note, just for a moment, you know, you've been kind of where Nolan is now as a freshman trying to yeah. get acclimated to life. And, you know, Nolan played a high level of uh, high school football, uh, certainly an IMG Academy against good opponents each and every week. And he had good practice opponents, uh, you know, on that campus. But obviously moving into the SEC, it's just a different kind of thing. It's a different kind of challenge. And I think he's handled that challenge uh, pretty well. But in terms of what he's being asked to learn and the, the physical challenge, of going up against offensive tackles who, who frankly know how to block even you know potentially elite pass yeah. rushers like that. What's the challenge like for Nolan in his first year trying to do as much as I think George would ultimately like to ask him to be able to do? Well, I think the, the challenge is number one when you're that when you come out of high school and your expectations are so high, you got to take away the thought that you're an athlete and start working as a technician. And that's the one thing I kind of alluded to Lorenzo and Davin a little bit. They were, they, became, they were athletes that never transitioned to the technician, and some of that comes with the way they're being taught. But I want to see Nolan, not this year. I like what he's doing, and he's going to get better for us. But I want to see specifically out of Nolan next year. I'm not worried about this year. He'll speed rush and you know, play with effort and get sacked this year. I need to see a guy at Georgia spin. I need a guy to see a Georgia swipe, double hand swipe. I need to see a guy at Georgia do a cross chop move that guys around the country in college that get a lot of sacks do. So uh, the culture means I need to see you develop those signature moves. That's it. I need to see somebody doing those things, and that's when that's what I expect from Nolan. He can do it. I've had a chance to see it. But you got to be able to do it in the game, but also you got to be able to be turned loose to do it in the game. Right now they ain't going to turn him loose. He's got to fit in with the rest of the guys. But eventually he'll, he'll, he'll come out of the crowd. Hey, Chuck, before I let you go, I'm having so much fun doing the uh, Falcons show with you. We do it every Monday and Friday at 1 p.m. on the AJC Atlanta Falcons News Now Facebook page. We call it AJC Falcons News Now. It's sponsored by Miller Lite. And, boy, I know it's not been the greatest Falcon season thus far, but to give folks a chance to kind of do what we do here on Dog Nation Daily, which is, you know, be a very interactive show, a lot of comments, a lot of chatter, and some, you know, frankly, some kind of blunt real talk. And the team's not playing well. We're going to talk about, you know, how they need to get better and maybe changes that need to be made if they don't get better. So, it's not been a great start to the season, but doing this show has been a ton of fun, and I hope that you're having as much fun doing it as I am. Man, I'm having a blast. And, uh, Falcon Talk, I'm riding with him, riding the die, but, you know, the truth, we have to talk to talk, and uh, right now it's not always positive. Well, that's certainly true. Uh, I appreciate you being with us here today. I'll see you tomorrow, 1 p.m., AJC Falcons News Now, sponsored by Miller Lite on the AJC Atlanta Falcons News Now Facebook page. That's how you search. You just type in AJC Atlanta Falcons News Now into your Facebook browser, and that'll get you to the page. And then live at 1 p.m. tomorrow, we'll be doing that show. Chuck, I look forward to doing that, and I hope that you enjoy the game on Saturday. I hope you enjoyed it a little bit less than most of my audience does. But uh, nonetheless, hope you have a good time watching the uh, Dogs and Vols on Saturday. <laughs> Yeah, if we win, I have a good time, Fred. And don't even try to be sarcastic like that. Bye, man. You that's, know you're wrong for that. <laughs> that's good stuff from Chuck Later, Smith, man. Appreciate your time. Uh, good stuff from him here on uh, Dog Nation uh, Daily today. And, boy, I really appreciate his um, – insight into the pass rush and the thing you gotta understand is is that Nolan and, and Chuck have known each other for a long time Chuck's worked and trained him uh he's been a part of that and boy you know you know I said this before Chuck loves the pass rushing game he loves the idea of getting after quarterbacks and making life miserable and for, for, for those signal callers and in a year in which George is trying to get better there in that regard you know, to have Chuck's inside in on that a couple times here in our program this year, I think has been incredibly valuable. And I, you know, I do like his idea of the pass rushing mentality, the mindset that's got to take place. And I do think, you know, given the number of times that Kirby Smart has talked about that, 
And given the number of times that that Kirby has said something to the effect of, hey, we're getting better, we're, we're, we're better at this, but we're not quite as good as we want to be. If Chuck is saying that Georgia has to have that pass rush mentality, when you listen to the way that Kirby Smart's language has evolved going back to the spring, when they first started hammering the notion of have it great and hammering it, the fact that they have stuck with that and they've got this stated goal, and it's kind of cool in that a lot of times you know, football teams – they don't want to get too specific with you about what their goals are. They want to keep those in-house. But Georgia's been pretty clear. They want to have Havoc plays on defense 20% of the time. That means for every defensive snap they take, one out of five, uh, one out of, five of those snaps, they want to either be a sack, a tackle for loss, a pass broken up, or a turnover. I mean, that's a pretty clear reflection of what they're looking to do, and it gives us a chance to kind of follow up on that and provide them some accountability for how they're doing. So I think it's kind of cool that Georgia's been as open on this topic as they have been, and if Chuck says it's all about a pass-rushing culture, certainly that kind of moves you in that direction. I think that's uh, pretty good stuff there from the Georgia Bulldogs. With that said, before we move on, let me transition here and do our Ortho Atlanta injury report. And this week, a good bit of uh, chatter but a few of the dogs that were kind of hobbled coming off the Notre Dame game, somewhat limited in practice last week, although that would be the you would expect that to be the case given the fact that Georgia didn't play this week. But at least one piece of good news in terms of a guy returning. So you're about to hear Kirby Smart, and admittedly, uh, this is not the world's greatest audio quality, but I'm going to play it anyway just to give you a chance to uh, hear from Kirby on this, whether it comes to uh, Eric Stokes, Tyson Campbell, Solomon Kinley, Karis Jackson's name comes up here. Here's a little bit of Kirby Smart as part of our Ortho Atlanta injury report, kind of going through the status of these guys heading towards the Vols on Saturday. And stay tuned for the good news there at the end on that. Here's Kirby on the uh, Ortho Atlanta injury report. Stokes, we think, is going to be able to practice today. And he did not practice on uh, Thursday. He, he conditioned and ran and moved around. He wasn't able to practice today. He's supposed to be able to go, full go and practice. Tyson is still limited a little bit. Uh, hoping to get him back before the end of the week. He's recovering quickly. Offensive line, Solomon would expect to uh, be able to go out today and do some work. Um, he's, we think he's going to be cleared to play, but we just don't know if he's going to be able to or not. It's going to depend on how many reps he can get today and tomorrow. Garris is clear to play. He's going to be able to play. We think he's going to be able to go out and do a good job for us. He practiced last week. And like I said, he's been practicing all along. It's never gone away uh, with, with his situation. He's just going to have a different uh, brace on, different splint on. But we think he's going to be good to go. It's my bad there on the uh, audio quality on that, but hopefully you get a chance to hear that, especially the good news there on Kyrus Jackson there at the end. Adding Kim back into that wide receiver mix, I think makes for a really interesting competition between Dominic Blaylock and Demetrius Roberts and the two guys we think kind of most similarly fit the position uh, that Kyrus Jackson is competing with. That should be fun to watch on uh, the field in Neyland Stadium on Saturday. It's Ortho Atlanta Injury Report. It's brought to you by Ortho Atlanta with 14 locations through Metro Atlanta. Uh, an orthopedic and sports medicine care for the whole family, including seniors and kids. They got 39 physicians, 450 employees dedicated to patient care. They also offer, uh, in addition to the quality of physician care, they've got in-house physical therapy, MRI imaging, outpatient surgery, after hours orthopedic care. Uh, it's for, as I said before, little leaguers, adults, weekend warriors, college athletes, professional athletes, and everything in between. You know, a good orthopedist can get you back in the game, but a great one can get you back your quality of life. And that's why we recommend Ortho Atlanta around here for any kind of orthopedic need you might be dealing with. The website for you to go to one more time is orthoatlanta.com. That's orthoatlanta.com to get in touch with the orthopedic specialists of Ortho Atlanta on the web at orthoatlanta.com. Let's take a look around the rest of the league. This is SEC Through. All right, we will get uh, Veron Haynes, the great former George running back, here coming up in just a moment. Before that, let me go uh, do a little SEC Through stuff with you here uh, just for a moment. And a um, couple things here to, uh, to uh, talk to you about here. You know, we talked to Chuck Smith a moment ago about the current state of affairs there in Knoxville. Obviously, it's not great right now. Chuck's, you know, kind of have some fun with that, but everybody kind of knows that things are kind of rough. However, one thing that did happen this week that I thought was kind of interesting is, you know, we've kind of joked on here about eventually Jeremy Pruitt, the, I'm sorry, Philip Former, the, uh, the the Tennessee Athletic Director, is going to try to work his way back into being Vols coach. You know, you see him at these press conferences. He's dressed like a coach. I think that he, you know, he certainly felt like he was uh, ousted at some point in time. Uh, probably unfairly, you know, some people go back and look at the way that he first became coach, kind of slipping in for uh, Johnny Majors. Some people think that he kind of uh, 
you know, kind of wants to get that job back. Well, he threw water on that yesterday on a radio interview there in Knoxville. Let me read this to, to you. This is the quote from Philip Fulmer saying, the thing that keeps coming up, and I can tell you I want to address it, the coaching chapter of my life, Fulmer says, is long closed, okay? I love doing what I'm doing at UT, but I love more being with my family and my grandchildren. I'm still, he says, the assistant to the assistant peewee baseball coach, and I'm the flag football coach. You can't do those things and coach at Tennessee. He also goes on to support Jeremy Pruitt here a little bit. Um, he says, uh, I'm going to tell you this, I totally believe in Coach Pruitt and the job he's doing. He's a leader. He's a recruiter. He's a hard worker. He's tough-minded. He confronts the issues that we have. And if you remember last week, we had Tony Barnard on the program, and I asked him if he thought that Fulmer wanted to coach at Tennessee again, and, and Barnhart was very clear in saying no. He didn't think that uh, Fulmer wanted to do that. And I've also had other people tell me, and I do believe, and I won't apologize for this, I think that, I think that Fulmer's a careerist. I think he's a guy that's always looking for career advancement. I do think he plays the the kind of back room, back uh, politics, office politics. I think he knows how to play that very well. And I think the thing that he's discovered is, as an athletic director, for the moment anyway, he's a pretty popular AD. And that he can be viewed as more of a long-term fix for the program as athletic director than he would be as kind of a short-term fix at head coach. Because at his age, let's face it, if he were to ever coach again, short-term would be the kind of only – kind of fix he'd be able to provide they're going to want someone younger more dynamic at a certain point in time they wanted someone more younger and dynamic back when Fulmer was coaching the first time around you better believe that'd be true this time around but Fulmer as the kind of elder statesman of the program is for now a popular AD and for the moment he's choosing to use that popularity on Pruitt lending his reputation over to Pruitt let's see how long that lasts though if the losses keep mounting up I'll be very very curious about that uh, moving on here just for a moment, I thought the Montgomery Advertiser had a pretty interesting profile of Gus Malzahn this week, taking a look at what has been one of the interesting storylines for Auburn in its hot start this season. Now, for the most part, accurately, you credit the Auburn defense for the reason why the Tigers are undefeated through this point in the season. However, offensively, you also see a little bit of the change compared to the past when it was Chip Lindsey uh, calling plays for Auburn previously. Lindsey is now gone. Before him, you had the brief window when Rat Lashley was calling plays for the Tigers. Well, Gus Malzahn has returned this season to the role that he was once in the beginning of his tenure as Auburn head coach, and obviously, famously, he was the offensive coordinator when the Tigers won the national championship in 2010. Thus far, it seems like Malzahn is really having a good time calling those plays. His quote to the Montgomery Advertiser is, because he's so busy during practice, he's not as bored anymore. And I think that's kind of a you know joke, obviously. He's not taking himself too seriously by saying that. But if you're curious about another pretty interesting subplot into this game on Saturday, the battle with, between the two coaches I do think is really very interesting because on the one hand, you've got Malzahn who's going to try to show that his offense with a freshman quarterback kind of running the ball again successfully for the first time did not do that very well a year ago against the Florida defense. It's the strength of that team. You know, I, you guys know I think that Florida's got some problems, but defensively, especially along the front seven, I think they're in pretty good shape. And um, when you look at Malzahn trying to get back and call plays in a tough spot on the road, how does that Auburn look look like on Saturday with Malzahn at the helm on this? That's a pretty fun subplot to pay attention to. Mullen much the same way. You know, Florida won as an underdog in this spot a year ago. Slight home underdog against LSU. They won the game outright. Mullen's going to try to prove he's got that same magic available to him this Saturday there as well. I actually think two head coaches that most of my audience probably doesn't like very much, certainly I'm no huge fan of either. But I think that showdown between Malzahn and Mullen on Saturday is actually a pretty fun deal and makes Auburn, Florida even more fun given the backstory with both of these guys. One more thing to mention here as part of our SEC through very quickly. Keep your eye on LSU and Utah State. Uh, Aggies quarterback Jordan Love is a very, very good player. But a 28-point underdog in Baton Rouge on Saturday. But LSU, Utah State could be a little bit of fun, so pay very close attention to that. But for now, here on Dog Nation Daily, let's get ready to talk to one, really one of our favorite guys to catch up with, and a guy who had a great moment for UGA back in 2001, a great career there as well, and also uh, big things with the Pittsburgh Steelers and the NFL after that. It's Veron Haynes back on Dog Nation Daily for the first time in a while. Veron, thank you so much for your time, and I know you're certainly busy this week every year because people want to think back to – you know, what you did, uh, you know, back in 2001. But we appreciate you coming on our show and sharing some of that time and thoughts with us here as well. So I hope you're doing well. Uh, I am. I am. We're, uh, the family and I are doing 
quite adequate and 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 thank you again for having us back on having me back on mm-hmm. Well, speaking of the family, before speaking of the family, before we're done, I want to ask you about your son because uh, he's doing big things in the high school ranks right now, and don't think we haven't noticed that. So we'll we'll, we'll get to that. Notice, in- notice, notice, notice! I said adequate because you could always do better, right? You know, I had a teammate, um, Fisco, Matt Fisco. Sure. Who, uh, I asked him how's his family, and he said we're adequate. He's like, you know why? There's always room for improvement, never settling. And I was like, you know what? That's catchy, and I love it. So that's our mom. We're adequate. <laughs> I, I, I certainly like that. That's uh, very well said and uh, really good stuff. And so uh, um, I think it's pretty good advice to live off of from a guy that's got a great story to tell. Obviously, all of us remember the 2001 game. I was lucky enough to be there, Georgia, Tennessee. And Veron, one of the things I've tried to you know remind, especially some of the younger folks this week, is there was a time when getting a win against Tennessee was a very big deal for Georgia. When you guys won there, when, won, won there in 2001, it had been, what, since probably, uh, what, I mean, I don't want to say wrong, but had, had it been since 1980, since Georgia had won there in Knoxville? It had been certainly a very long time uh, before the uh, dog, maybe it was 82 the last time they won there, but it had been a long time since uh, Georgia had won at Tennessee, and you guys won the last second with your touchdown, famously uh, called the hobnail boot game because of Larry Munson's call. I mean, what do you remember about 2001 in Knoxville? So that, that 2001 series, I think that game really put everything into perspective. When Coach Rick came in, he preached the model was finished to grow. So in that game, I think you saw determination, grit, and finally, culture. Because I think that was the defining game that everyone, if you were on the edge of buying in, not, you know, when you have a new coaching staff, that tends to happen. Not everybody's necessarily bought in yet. But that was the defining moment, I believe. Yeah, no, I think so. I mean, I think a lot of people kind of draw that line and connect what happened uh, you know, over that game in 2001. The following year, Georgia goes on to win the SEC, and Mark Rick really puts together a really good career at UGA, and that game kind of provides the, the springboard from, for that, even though it happened, obviously, a year prior to that. How much later did you find out that Larry Munson had had the great call? Because, obviously, I'm a fan. I'm, I'm there watching the game, and I'm driving home from Knoxville later on that night, and it's only – it's really a few hours later that you realize that Larry Munson had one of these calls that was going to be remembered forever like so many of his calls were. You're a part of that, and you're, you're a part of the Munson call. When did you find out that what Munson had said was going to be so well-remembered and kind of so famous among Georgia fans? So, <laughs> funny story about that. We're sitting in the locker room in Knoxville, and Larry is getting interviewed by CBS Sport. I think it was CBS or, or one of those um, nationally held by Fox. Maybe. I don't. I don't know who it was. I don't recollect. But the first, the words out of Larry, um, the interviewer's mouth was, "Mr. Munson, what is the hobnail boot?" and Typical Larry says, the hell if I know. (laughs) But that was his genius. He was the legendary voice of Georgia for so many reasons, just for that very particular statement. So many people I've met after has resonated with them that they used to, has, has, has also shared the stories with me that they used to turn the TV volume down and raise the volume up on the radio and Larry would put you in to the game. No, and I, those, are, those are the rich tradition and memories that we take away from Larry Munson. No, I think that's really well said, Veron. I'm glad to hear you say that because I think so many Georgia fans feel the same way. Obviously, I know you're having fun watching this team now, especially given the fact that your position running back is such a big part of what UGA does. How impressed have you been with Georgia thus far? How much do you like what DeAndre Swift, the rest of these running backs are doing? As a guy who knows the position so well and kind of knows what winning football is all about, what do you think of this current crop of UGA players? Totally amazing. Uh, we when I said culture back then, we was just establishing it from what, you know, we had, I got away from it for a while. You know, and I say that because with all the talent that we had throughout the years, you would think that, you know, Marcus Stroud, Richard Seymour, Tim Bailey, Quincy Carter, it, we had a talented team. 
but that culture had gotten away from what Herschel and them had left. So I think what we kind of did that day was just set the foundation, reset the foundation. Yeah. And now you see, when I was listening to um, the coach for the Browns, and, 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 and he said, you know what you're going to get out of Nick yesterday yeah. when he, when, when he uh, got interviewed. He said, I don't have to worry about that. That's the special. He's special in itself. And that's before he even, we were even talking about his talents and all the other stuff that he brings to the table. But every single day he brings his hard hat. And that's what I'm seeing resonate so much with this Georgia team from the last few years. It's back. And it's contagious. And I love what I'm seeing. DeAndre Swift. Is in, a, is, is in a class of his own. He's a special kind of back who's going to do remarkable things. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And before we let you go, I did want to ask you about this. Um, we kind of joked about this before, but it, really, your son Justice Haynes is a freshman for uh, Blessed Trinity. Big stats yeah. for him already. And obviously, it's always going to be kind of a source of curiosity anytime we see a, a last name that we recognize. And, uh, you know, I'm old enough now. There are a lot of these last names that I recognize, lots of sons of, of, of players that I know well who are doing big things. But how much fun is it watching your son right now? And I, you know, as he kind of begins his high school career, but uh, you know, Blessed Trinity is obviously a great program. I know a lot of folks over there, and I know how much you know winning and success they've enjoyed. And you're getting a chance to kind of you know watch your son, I guess, travel the path that you once traveled. How much how much fun is that for you right now? It's 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 incredible, you know, being able to see him take what he had learned from a long time ago, which is the hard work and the success. Like nothing, success comes before work, only in the dictionary. So. He, he he puts in the work, and he's getting to see the reward. I'm just in awe because it, it, it's such an electrifying atmosphere over there at BT, and Coach Mack has done a great job of getting everybody to just be on the same page. And I love what I'm seeing coming out of, of, of the whole team in itself. But Justice is handling it well. He's, a, you know, he's 14 years old. So <laughs> we're just getting started, yeah. but 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 he had a couple of two hundred yard games in there, and 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 and, and he, I don't I don't you know when you're too stupid to even understand the magnitude <laughs> of, of of what you're doing. And I had a good friend of mine that says keep him stupid for the rest of his career, <laughs> like just, just keep him done because he's walking around like I'm like Dude, this is not normal, like fourteen years old, yeah. but. You know, so it, 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 it's, 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 it's quite an a, a accomplishment for him, and I'm happy for him, but it's just the beginning. We do understand that, too, and it is a team sport. Embrace that. But also, you got to understand that right now you're, 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 you're getting examples of what it takes to be successful, not just on the football field or in the baseball field, but in life, hard work. I think it's really well said, Veron. You know, you've still got so many folks here in our audience who are certainly so proud of, uh, you know, what you did in Georgia Uniform and what you've done, you know, since then there as well. And hearing you reminisce on uh, great moments of the past and your current thoughts on the team, and obviously great to see your family having success there as well. We really appreciate you being with us here today on Dog Nation Daily. Thanks for sharing your time with us, and we hope we get a chance to catch up with you and talk again very soon. Always a pleasure, Pete. Thank you again. Great stuff there from Veron Haynes. All right, so as we uh, wrap up here, we'll get ready to do so with our uh, Gator Hater Updater and uh, let you know that uh, – how long has it been? Let's take a look at this. 1,069 days. That's how long it's been since Florida's beaten Georgia. Around here, we're big believers that uh, good Georgia fans are supposed to be Gator haters. And, uh, boy, it's uh, nice to see that number at 1,069. Look forward to seeing that thing continue to climb even beyond – the beginning of November when we think Georgia gets another win against the Gators and we also think Florida probably loses on Saturday not even probably we think it's a uh, loss for Florida coming to Auburn on Saturday and kind of a reckoning coming for Dan Mullen here with the uh, Auburn game the LSU game looming obviously Georgia after that uh, keep keep your eye on South Carolina there as uh, well it could be happening that uh that downturn we expect for Florida over the next few weeks we may get a chance to see that but nonetheless more from us tomorrow a bigger look at Georgia Tennessee getting ready for the Vols in Neyland on Saturday look forward to having you as a part of it right here on Dog Nation Daily 
And on video, we'll do our R.S. Andrews cool down, air, heating, plumbing, electric. You know, R.S. Andrews does all those things for us. They can do all those things for you there as well. They show up on time. They do the work that's promised for the price that's promised. That's the reason why Dog Nation recommends R.S. Andrews. You can find them online at rsandrews.com. We went really long on the comments last couple of days. i got to knock off here in just a moment because um, i got some stuff to take care of with the uh, radio show and the podcast, so I'll have to kind of do that. But we do have some time to kind of jump in here and get some of your comments for now, so we will uh, get ready to do that. And, of course, really appreciate you being with us. Uh, your thoughts on the recruiting stuff from Jeff Sintel, your thoughts on Georgia versus Tennessee on Saturday, really good stuff from Chuck Smith on Nolan Smith, great stuff from Veron Haynes on DeAndre Swift. Uh, you can talk about anything you want to here for a, a little bit. Um, a really good point from Matt Rukavina, by the way. A lot of people remember uh, – Veron Haynes from the Hobnail Boot game, but he says against Tech in 2001, he had 40 carries. That's actually a really good point by Matt. Really good point. Uh, George Wrigley says, look for a floor to win. So George going the uh, opposite direction here for me. He likes the uh, Gators against Auburn. The number has uh, has certainly come down at least a little bit. A half point means a lot when you're talking about a three point spread. Auburn at one point in time favored by three. If you want to find it, Auburn two and a half somewhere, uh, you can find that out there now. So a little bit of movement in the Gators' direction here at the moment. Uh, Peter Jeffrey Wilson says, chop loud tonight. I'm looking forward to being at the game tomorrow for the Braves and Cardinals. We'll be watching this one tonight on our screen as we do our Marlowe's matchup. So, yeah, boy, that, that's going to be a lot um, a lot there. Will Summer says, BR, are you taking the dogs with the points? So George is a 25 and a half point favor. For the first time this year, I actually took Tennessee plus the points as a part of our R.S. Andrews Go With the Flow, which will air Friday on the Dog Nation video channels. Uh, so I did take Tennessee plus the points there. My th- thought on this is is that Georgia games have gone under for the last five. That means the expected point total, Georgia's been below that. I think it's kind of hard to cover a really big spread in a game that's kind of going below the expected total points. Georgia's had a stingy defense, so that obviously helps in that regard. But for now, I'm going to, you know, listen, I wouldn't bet this, but uh, I am going to take, uh, I'm going to take Tennessee plus the points and say that Georgia just slightly misses out on a cover there. Brian Fortner, a little bit surprised to hear the number was that high. But yeah, that's kind of where it was. Let me pop over to YouTube here for a moment there as well and kind of see what's going on over here. Jazz Jackson, which is an unbelievably cool name, says, I think the passing game gets vertical this week. Look for big games from D-Rob, Pickens, and others. Jake's going to have 275 yards. Well, obviously that happens. All of a sudden, the 25-and-a-half point win is well back in play again. And, you know, I guess I kind of agree with a lot with what DJ Shockley said a little earlier, that Jake Fromm certainly could do that. I wish that George would turn him loose and let him do that. But in the current confines of the offense, George at least needs to be efficient when it chooses to throw the football. And the the problem I have with the Notre Dame game was not that it wasn't throwing it enough. It was just throwing it in an inefficient manner. If you're throwing, you know, passes for four yards, I mean, I don't care how many guys are stacked against the box. Georgia is going to run it for about four yards no matter, no matter how many guys you have against the box. If you throw it, you've got to throw it. You've got to throw passing plays that are designed to get more than just four and a half yards, which is about what Georgia was averaging uh, per pass there in the first half. So I agree with Shot. That you don't have to throw it every single time. You don't even have to throw it the, the majority of the times. You just have to be efficient when you do throw it. And um, yeah, so I, I'd love to see it. I'm a little skeptical, though. I will admit, I'm a little skeptical at least for right now. But I do hope you're right, Jazz. I do. Pro King 123 says Georgia can cover that spread. And yeah, listen, there's no doubt they can. It's just a matter of will they. And I guess this is also a thing, Evan. I joked about this on our cool down from a couple of days ago that I think I just. I talked a little too much trash for the Notre Dame game, and so whether I'm right or whether I'm wrong, I'm trying to, I guess, be a little bit more humble here for a little bit. I'm looking at October being a month where Georgia grows into something. You know, and I think, I think there's room for growth. I think growth is needed. I think Georgia needs to grow into something. And so while that's going on, I guess I'm going to take a little bit of a wait-and-see approach about the evolution of this offense for right now. Bill Kelly says Tennessee will sell out to stop the run until we burn them a few times. And Bill, I think you're probably right about that. Now, does Tennessee, you know, given some of the weaknesses it's had along its lines of scrimmage, do they have the ability to actually do that? That remains to be seen. But certainly from a schematic approach, they'll probably do something pretty similar to what Notre Dame tried two Saturdays ago. And Georgia may be in kind of that keep chopping mentality where it's looking to wear them out over the course of the game. Um, uh, 
uh, what else is going on here? I'm not even sure what Dallas Schwartz comment means. Um, Scott Harris says the Veron interview was great. That's great to hear. With all the bad announcers these days, I wish you could still turn up, turn turn down the TV and uh, turn up Larry. Uh, I miss Larry Munson every single day. I do. And, and you know, Larry's one of those guys I never really got a chance to know. When I was first starting going into press boxes, it was near the very end of Larry's career. I remember the first year I was in the Georgia press box at all would have been 2004. And Munson was still the play-by-play guy then, and he was obviously not in you know, great health even probably in 2004, you know, certainly not as, as great of health as he had been. It was one of those things, you know, I just never wanted to go up and talk to him. I never wanted to do that. I always wanted to give him space. You know, for the most part, that's what a press box is for anyway. People are there to work, so you kind of stay out of their way and let them work. But with me being a very young guy, Munson being obviously the influential figure he'd been on my life prior to that, there was always that temptation of like just wanting to go up to him and say, hey, just want to let you know what you mean to me. Sometimes that kind of stuff is unsatisfying because, you know, I don't take compliments very well. A lot of people don't take compliments well. And, you know, sometimes that conversation in general just sometimes doesn't go the way you want it to. And maybe that's also part of the reason why I never did it. But I can promise you I always wanted to. And I always, you know, sometimes when I was walking around the state, you know, like when I would first get on campus and I'm walking around the stadium, you know, Munson was kind of famous for walking. He did a walk through the stadium. It was like a little bit of exercise that he got before the games. A lot of times I'd see him doing that. And it was just always, you know, iconic figure doesn't even put it into words. Uh, so iconic, even that I never went up and talked to him, never said anything to him. Uh, Jeff used to work with him, though, so Jeff knew Munson pretty well. But uh, he was an intern when Munson was radio host. This is going back like early 90s when Jeff was very young. But me, by the time I was in the same room with Munson, it was uh, much later. And uh, it just didn't feel right to go up and speak to him, although I wish I would have gotten a chance to. One of the things I did get to do a couple of times, it was the great thrill of my life, was I've done a couple of radio shows in prior life before I came to Dog Nation. I've, I've done a couple of radio shows from the Larry Munson Broadcast Suite. And so if you're in the home radio booth for Georgia there at uh, Sanford Stadium, you know, you've got the very nice plaque on the outside of the broadcast booth. You've got the really nice mural, kind of like we have like our wall behind us, the really nice uh, wall. Um, it's a great mural of Munson calling games and some images like that. So. They've done a good job honoring Munson. Fans can't see this because inside the press box. But they've done a good job honoring Munson from in there. But, um, but uh, yeah, so I've got a chance to broadcast from in there, but never got a chance to speak to Munson, although I wish I would have. Woody Tripp says, B.A., listening today from Virginia, waiting on the birth of our first grandchild. That's amazing, Woody. Congratulations. Adding to Dog Nation. Well, uh, certainly our prayers go out for you for a healthy delivery there. Congratulations, and we appreciate you spending some time. I don't know if you're in the waiting room or whatever, kind of passing the time, but we appreciate you spending a little bit of time with us today. That's a, that's a great thing to be able to hear. Bill Coon says our conservative play calling protects Jake Fromm, who is arguably, um, uh, no offense to the mailman, the player we can afford the least to be injured. If we can win running the ball 100 times, then so be it. Yeah, I guess, Bill, it comes down to, do we believe that at a certain point that George is going to be facing the kind of opponent which it has to throw to win against? Probably so, and I think that Fromm's equal to that task. Now, I understand your point about not wanting to get Fromm hurt. I think that's a, that's a very different thing to guard against, a very difficult thing to guard against. Football is just a, is just a tough game, and you know, being careful and avoiding injury, and a lot of people say that's a good way to get somebody hurt at some point in time, but I understand what the point you're making. Um, Jethro Smith says, B.A., what are my opinions on athletes being allowed to earn – on their likeness. I'm totally in favor of this. I've never been in favor of the teams themselves paying the players because while certainly the colleges generate enough money, the, to, to me there's kind of an inherent unfairness in how do you deal with that? How do you dole that out? I'm kind of a free market person for the most part, and I like the idea of college players being able to enter the free market. So if you're a big time quarterback at whatever school and so and so car dealership wants to pay you to be an endorser, I think it's unseemly to prohibit someone from being able to do that. Todd Gurley selling his autographs is an example of something we can all you know, have kind of a first-person experience with. The idea that Gurley doesn't own his own signature just seems bizarre to me. Um, I am of the belief that fewer guys actually have enough fame to capitalize on this, as we might think. Uh, I think you know, there's not an endless supply of people willing to you know, kind of pay these kinds of endorsement deals or autograph deals or you know, things like that. So ultimately, it may not be quite the impact that, that some people assume it will be. But in terms of the California law, I actually think it's a fair law. I think it makes a lot of sense. And I 
I hope the rest of the country follows suit. No one loves college football more than me, and no one would be, I guess, scared of something that might harm the future of college football more than me. And I know some people look at this as a potential threat to uh, to football and college athletics in general. I don't feel that way. I, I think pretending that this isn't a real world scenario that has to be dealt with that to me is the real threat to the sport because one way or another restricting the trade the marketability of guys when it comes to their own face their own signature their own likeness that's an untenable situation for the future so i'm i'm in favor of it at least you know the california law that i understand as i understand it and some of the other legislation that's on the way i am in favor of that uh let me go back over to uh, facebook here for a moment cuz i've been on youtube here now for a little bit we got about five more minutes of comments. We'll knock a few of these out. Um, Wayne Fullen says, can we just have two shows, one for Facebook, one for YouTube? You never know. That's not, not a bad idea. Um, <laughs> although I do like the idea of being able to be on multiple platforms at the same time. And I feel like some of y'all don't think so, but I feel like I do a pretty good job of kind of toggling back and forth. Um, oh, this is interesting. This is an interesting prediction. Gary and Christian Gulasano says, B.A., you need to talk about this. Don't be surprised when Juwan Jennings plays some quarterback. He says, I'm friends with his brother, and he told me he's been practicing the last two weeks. It's kind of interesting. You know, Kentucky on Saturday, and I'm going to blank on the kid's name, and I shouldn't because he's a very good player. Kentucky's got a really, really dynamic athletic wide receiver, and I'm kicking myself for not thinking of his name. But at the end of the game against South Carolina, they put him at quarterback, and he was, uh, you know, he moved the ball down the field, mostly as a runner, but, uh, but pretty impressive. So, yeah, Tennessee using Jennings there. Uh, first of all, it's interesting insight that you might be bringing to the table. Um, I certainly certainly wouldn't put it past them to be able to do it. And as I said before, you cite the Kentucky game this past Saturday as an example of that kind of working. You know, a guy who's dangerous with his legs. And I'm thinking back to this. When you get a little older, your memory starts to fade a little bit. I'm pretty sure I did a high school. I used to do high school games on on uh, TV back on the old CSS network. I'm pretty sure I did a high school game for Jennings playing quarterback for, uh, did he go, to, did he go to, those of you who know the Tennessee, uh, uh, high school scene, did he go to Blackman? Is that where, is that where Juwan Jennings went? Like I said, I am, uh, my mind starts to, uh, to fade a little bit, but I'm pretty sure, I think it may have been Blackman, which is a, a pretty good program in the state of Tennessee. And uh, I'm pretty sure it was Jennings who was the quarterback big arm he had a really big arm now there's more to playing quarterback than just that but um but i'm pretty sure i did see jennings play quarterback in high school i I believe he's a little bit of a prospect uh billy hurley says um initially the passes for george will be short because tennessee loads the box and blitzes we need the short pass to turn into big runs after catch which which is not a bad point once tennessee stays in box and decreases the blitz from throws mid to d balls 250 yard plus passing day 400 yards total offense. It's a pretty good prediction from Billy, and I think the overall explanation of that is also pretty good as well, that you know Georgia tried something against Notre Dame that just didn't work. And as frustrating as some of those very short passes were, um, uh, it was an attempt to get playmakers the ball in space and give them a chance to make would-be tacklers miss, and Notre Dame, to its credit, just responded to that pretty well. So that's actually a pretty good point from Billy, a uh, pretty good point. Um, Matt Talley says if Fromm doesn't have 300 yards a game, that means our running game is working and or we're uh, far ahead. There's no need to pass. We keep running out the clock. I don't care how we win, just win, baby. And that's fair to say. I guess the one thing that I maybe think that is a little bit different than some of what y'all think, Matt, may be included here, is that when you look at some of the games that Georgia has lost, LSU last year, uh, Auburn the year before that, ironically, both road games. When you look at those games, the running game from Georgia was kind of taken away, and then the question of, okay, what is it that you do next? So, you know, Matt, my one response to you would be, is this is not a situation where you choose between a rushing offense that's working and go to a passing offense that is also working because people just think that's a better brand of offense. That's, that, to me, is the false choice here. The issue for Georgia is obviously any team would run the ball down the field if they thought that would work, right? Because it's just the safest, it's the easiest. Um, the reason why teams end up not running the ball is because they have to do something else to move the football. And Georgia's been in a couple of positions in the last couple of years, uh, as I said before, LSU and Auburn uh, in 1817, where where the running game kind of was taken away. At least the at least at least the uh, defensive look made it seem difficult to run the ball. You know, maybe that's just you know, a good look by defensive coordinator or whatever, but the running game was seemingly taken away. And then how does Georgia respond to that? That's my issue. 
not stop a successful running game because passing is better, but when the running game is stymied, what do you do after that? And I do think that is still an unanswered question for Georgia. Uh, let's do about maybe one or two more comments. I'll do one on Facebook and kind of go to YouTube after that. And I apologize, we can't stay much longer here today, but uh, we'll try to do a longer stretch of comments, maybe tomorrow. Um, what else is going on? Joel Moody says that's one of the passing game. Uh, uh, that's when the passing game needs to be ready. These SEC West road games, and I, I believe he's right about that. Against those good teams on the road, a lot of those right now are from the West. Uh, you know, that's when you need that passing game to be firing. Miriam Martin Corbin says, when the big uglies who protect or block the star quarterback and running backs um, uh, get uh, zero dollars stars and get big bucks, uh, you think uh, that won't divide the locker? Oh, so she's kind of arguing against the um, um, the uh, the pay for pay for play stuff and i understand that 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 some players are going to get more than other players do but you know i would argue that's just kind of a you know the nature of football i mean that's true in the nfl there as well where you've got star players who are making in some cases 20 and 30 million dollars and other guys who are getting a fraction of that and i think i think the players themselves are more aware of the facts on the ground than than you know non-players are from time to time that you know life is sometimes about equal opportunity and uneven outcomes. And I think the uh, the marketability of football players is maybe the perfect example of that. Jeremy Lloyd, good point. Heard Roquan Smith back on the field this week. Anyone seen that? Yeah, I saw the uh, thing on TV yesterday where I guess Roquan's expected to play on Sunday. They are traveling to London. Take on the Raiders, I believe it is. Uh, so, yeah, Roquan is... I guess apparently back playing, so maybe all is well that ends well. It's still a situation where I think Roquan probably one way or another still needs your prayers, whatever it is that he's been dealing with. Um, Jazz Jackson, good idea here. Staying in Gatlinburg Friday through Sunday with the game there. In Knoxville on Saturday, that sounds like a pretty fun trip. Uh, good times. Uh, DWB says Georgia should open it up against Tennessee all day, let Jake throw for 400, shut the critics up once and for all, but it won't. Just let Georgia be Georgia. Yeah, I would love to see Georgia be a little looser, a little freer, but um, we shall see how it goes down. Um, Caleb Herto says, uh, what happens when boosters promise recruits endorsements to come to their school? I guess I'm not all that scandalized by that, but I can understand why some people feel differently. Um, I feel like that, you know, your marketability is your own, is your own thing, and whatever, <laughs> whatever your value and worth is, I think you'll be able to get that money. That's my, that's my feeling. Green Soldier says that Facebook's getting all the love today. See, and here's where things get unfair. Um, a minute ago, Wayne Folan says I was showing nothing but love to a YouTube, and uh, now uh, YouTube says I'm showing too much love to Facebook. Of course, we are. We, we love our guy, the Green Soldier here. The problem is trying to get as many comments as I can in the limited window we have available today. Uh, Enrique Murillo says, where are we going to be for the Tennessee game? So I'll tweet out the gate location for uh, the dog walk, and we'll definitely be live outside of Neyland Stadium for that. And then, of course, we'll do our Pella Window postgame show from inside the stadium once it's over. And hopefully we're going to get because I'm not staying in in uh, Knoxville Friday night. I'm going to the Braves game tomorrow afternoon, so I'm looking forward to that. We're going to get to Knoxville hopefully early enough to be walking around. So maybe we'll tweet out something. Uh, I don't know if we're going to go to Calhoun's or you know walk up and down the river or what, but I'd like to I'd like to be in the scene at least a little bit before we have to get too busy working. So maybe we'll try to... Uh, Make some sort of announcement about that. Um, uh, Chapman Dog says, what about the Twitterverse? That's right. We still haven't taken care of these Twitter comments. I think the problem for me is is I've never quite figured out how to use the Twitter interface for comments. We're going to have to practice that just a little bit. Uh, Philip Seabolt says, give us a brave score for today. I'll take the Braves. Pretty good offensive team. Give me 5-2 give me to two today. Give me a 5-2 Braves uh, win. Give me a 5-2 Braves win. I'll take that any day of the week. Um, uh, also, DWB mentioning Noah Sewell's thoughts on uh, UGA. Yeah, uh, really good stuff from Jeff Sintel with Noah. Uh, we had that on uh, uh, Before the Hedges presented by Kroger yesterday. Really good stuff all the way around. Um, uh, Jazz says, I'm doing a good job of switching, calling audibles like Jake Fromm and switching between Facebook and YouTube. I do kind of pride myself on that. I feel like I run the most interactive show in the business. Y'all look at the rest of these dog nation folks. Uh, when they're doing their shows and their little Facebook lives and things like that uh, and YouTube feeds, they're not nearly as interactive as I am. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm mixing in a lot of these comments. I, f- I feel like I do that pretty well. Uh, Green Soldier says, Sewell just might be a dog. And 
Yeah, you know, I'm starting to round into that thought as well. This was always for me going to be a difficult difficult recruitment, but as much as eh, probably not feeling great about the running back situation right now, probably feeling a little bit better about Sewell. I think it's a pretty good point. Um, Enrique brings up a good point. The Twitter comments disappear, and that's what makes it kind of hard to read those. Uh, he says it's hard to look for old comments. You'd have to scroll to find them. Yeah, so i gotta, I got to figure out if I can get a little bit better with that. Memphis Dog also catching me in an error after I was bragging on myself for uh, my ability to audible and kind of stay with the play at the line of the scrimmage. Um, no Eddie on the desk today. That's a big error. Uh, chalk me up as an L for that one. Uh, Eddie is right there to my left, but um, I did not put him on the uh, set today. That's a big, big, um, it's a big error. D Wills 11 says, I'm never quite sure how to take this, that I look tired today. Uh, <laughs> Thanks, D. Will. That's exactly what I was. That's exactly what I was uh, uh, hoping to hear. Um, Rob W. says, "Why no super chats?" I'm assuming that means the long, you know, extended comment section we've done in the past. This time of year, we have so many extra shows and so much to plan for. It gets a little harder to do that. You know, back during the off season, we'd stay till noon some days because we ha- we just generally speaking had less going on. Um, it's getting a little bit harder to do that. A little bit harder. To, uh, we just got a lot going on. So maybe that's why I look tired, uh, to D wills point. Maybe so. Um, Jennifer Stevenson Fleming says, come to Calhoun's BA. I'd actually really like to do that. I'd really like to do that. Uh, maybe we can do that. And Winston and Jennifer, thank you so much for the, for the uh, kind words. I really appreciate that. Um, Susan, thank you for the kind words there as well. I appreciate that very much. Y'all are, y'all are incredibly nice to us. Say that really appreciate that. Um, <laughs> uh, y'all are funny. I appreciate that. Y'all are uh, uh, very, very kind. All right. So um, I should have said this during Dog Nation Daily, and I didn't. Y'all join us tonight, 6 p.m. Now, there was some confusion on Twitter. Tonight is our Marlowe's matchup show, but it's not live from Marlowe's Tavern. We're doing our Marlowe's stuff a little bit differently this year, where we're doing essentially close to the same number of Marlowe's uh, live events that we did last year. We're just doing a Marlow show every week. So tonight we'll be in Dog Nation World Headquarters Studios. I'll have the Braves game on the TV. I'll be watching it during during the uh, broadcast. Myself, John Stinchcomb, will get ready for the Dogs and Vols. That'll be video only tonight for that. No live event. We're going to be live in a Marlow's a couple weeks from now. I'll give you more details about that when we get there. But uh, be here and be with us on video if you can, 6 p.m. tonight for the Marlowe's matchup. And then tomorrow morning, 10 a.m., back for Dog Nation Daily once again. By the way, speaking of the Braves and the playoffs, check out AJC.com as well. Not only can you get all of your Atlanta news now there, you can also uh, certainly get a lot of coverage on the uh, Braves and the playoffs too. So make sure you check that out. AJC.com, Atlanta News Now, Braves, big-time blow-up, getting ready for the playoffs. So I hope you'll check out all of that. Huge thanks to R.S. Andrews for uh, bring, being here and being a part of our R.S. Andrews cool down, air, heating, plumbing, electric. You can trust them to play all those positions for you. They play all those positions for us here on uh, Dog Nation there as well. Find them online at rsandrews.com. You all have a great day. See you back here tomorrow morning, 10 a.m. for Dog Nation Daily Live all over again.